Hello my friend, Eunice Adubango in my space. Welcome back from Travels of a Mother. Wow, I'm still like some of you who are asking me if maybe we can ask the proprietors of Sky's Hotel to open for you to go in the room and just sit there and linger in the presence of God. I am still wondering what that is that happened there both at Sky's Hotel and in Nairobi. In fact, I'm in that place where I'm not sure if my energies are high or if my energies are low. Because you see, when the Lord visits you, he leaves you in awe. Our forefathers used to actually not even pronounce the name of God. You know the name we call Yahweh? It actually doesn't even have an A and doesn't even have an E. And so the Jews when they would ask them who visited you, their answer would be, ah, visited me. That his name was so rich and so deep that you could not just mention it anyhow. Those are some of the things that the Lord does. We thank God so much for showing up. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Sabaoth, the mighty one, the terrible one. He showed up and he fought our battles. We still are hearing so many testimonies that are strange to us because when we were in that room, we met to call on the name of the Lord for the sake or on behalf of our children. But because we went in just the right way, the Lord dealt with everything else that he knows affects our children. So I'm hearing people who have contracts that have been renewed that had not been renewed on a long, for a long time. I'm hearing women who got healed. In all honesty, I never made a prayer of healing. I'm hearing women who say right there in the room while they were there, they got debt cancellation. I'm hearing women who are talking about their stubborn children suddenly getting a turn around. It is overwhelming. It's mind boggling. It is too much to handle. But I want to give a shout out to our online team, the people who are all over the world, in Munich, in, in um, France, in South Africa, in Chad, in Pretoria, in Johannesburg, in, you know, Tanzania, those that were in Kenya. I got people who are in Nairobi who tuned in online for Uganda and then they came physically in Nairobi. You see, the thing that I can't get over that I don't understand about the online thing is how the Lord moved through the airwaves and reached the people who are online. I have got testimonies and I've got feedback of people who are slain the entire time. But you know for me what that means? It means that you prepared well and you engaged. I must confess, I really didn't want to do the online version of the event because in my mind, I thought people were not going to give it the due respect or the due attention that it demands. I, it's a weakness. I tend sometimes to fight what should be the Lord's battles. I tend to defend God. I tend to feel like, why should people just not care about my father? Why should my father be in the room and people just are, you know, are cooking and whatever and they are online? But to see that people were online from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. and they did not move. I don't know. I'm still asking God what that is that happened. But thank you everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming on time. Thank you for traveling for your children. Your children are never going to be the same again. Now I am back and we are going to start a series on prayer. We are going to have a lot of teachings on this channel on prayer. Some of them are answers to questions that happened while we were in travels. Some of them are things that I know people do are missing prayer. Some of them are going to be testimonies from my life of prayer. I'm going to have some ladies, especially those who attended with us travels, to just sit down with me and we will dissect and we will learn. I found also, I discovered when I was preparing for travels that sometimes I even teach better when I have someone in the room. So we are going to have series when I will have someone and they will just be there maybe to ask me the questions that you would ask me as an audience. And as I'm teaching them, I know that you will learn. So what are we talking about today? Today we are talking about altars. One of the things that was strange for most of the people who came for Travels of a Mother was how to set up an altar, how to manage an altar, how to service an altar. Do I have to have only one altar and does it do everything? Is this altar thing just a fad? Is this altar thing just a ritual? What are altars? One of the things that I have learned in my walk with God is that our spiritual life actually has protocols. 
The only thing that I caution you though is never go into something because you think that it is the magic wand that is going to do for you uh, miracles. So I don't want you to approach the topic of altars from a place where you feel, oh my God, if I only do the altar, everything will be fine. No, no, people. The Bible tells us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. If we can do those things, we will be fine. So if you are going to set up as an altar, as an act of idolatry where you think if you didn't have an altar, the Lord would not work or descend, please don't. Please don't. Those of you who know me well know that the thing that I fear the most in my life is taking the place of God. The thing that I fear the most in my life is replacing the Lord or the presence of God with mere rituals. I have a man of God I know who is close to me who actually used not to even want us to call it altars because he would say that it reminds him of shrines. He just wanted to say devotion time. Well, an altar is a place of connection. It is a, cl a place of connection between the heavenly realm or the spirit realm and the earthly realm. It is where man connects with the spirit realm. So it is a place, but it is also a time. There are altars that are stationary that are in the same place and they never move. For example, all our churches and buildings and where we meet on Sundays to pray are altars. They are a place of man connecting with the spirit realm. But also an altar can be a mobile altar. I can be an altar. I can be the place where Eunice or other people who connect with Eunice connect with the spirit realm. That is why there are people who get into your presence and because they are an altar, things just start to happen in your life. Strange things start to happen in your life. So simply defined, that is what an altar is. And an altar can be a godly altar where man meets with the spirit of the living God or meets with the Lord of hosts or it can be a satanic altar where man connects with the satanic deity. So altars are in both worlds. And in the other world, most of the places where there are shrines are altars. Now, certain times altars actually have a thing that represents them. They have maybe a monument, it can be a tree, it can be a chair, it can be a small house, it can be a mat, it can be just a room. An altar can be a physical place and there can be a monument. But also sometimes, especially for purposes of camouflage, an altar can be in a place where you cannot tell that it is an altar. But for some reason, every time that you get into that place, strange things begin to happen to you. So in the realm of the spirit of God, where I want to teach this, although I will just give a bit of juxtaposition, you know, like comparisons, an altar is a place where we meet the living God. Even in heaven where the 24 elders are, they are at an altar. Even when Paul was moving in the book of Acts, when he was talking to these people who didn't understand God and, you know, were claiming for them, they do not understand God, they don't worship God, they don't know. I remember he told them that as I was moving around, that is in Acts, Acts chapter 17, verse 23, he said, I found a place with an inscription saying, to an altar of an unknown God. That this is an altar of an unknown God. So they used to establish altars, a place of meeting. And these people didn't know that this place had been established to meet Jehovah, Jireh, the Lord, the living one, the all-sufficient one, El Shaddai. But they kept saying that for them, they don't believe in God. We see our forefather Abraham built so many different altars. And I'll go through some of them. Jacob built an altar that is famous that most of us know. Actually, there are two that are famous. But uh, there are two instances that are famous, but they happened in the same place. When Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau, and he was running, the time that he was running where he ended up meeting Laban, the Bible tells us in Genesis 35, 7 to, 4, to 11, that Jacob there in the dead of the night, out of fear, because he wanted the Lord to meet him. He established an altar that he called Bethel. 
and he established that altar in commemoration of the Lord appearing to him because when Jacob left he was scared he did not think he was loving love, loved anymore and then when he reached this place and he pitched his camp and the Lord appeared to him he called the place Bethel to mean God appeared to me and the Bible says he built an altar Jacob went on his way and he came back when he was coming up back and he was about to meet his brother Esau again the Bible this time records in Genesis 28 12 that first of all he you know he got a stone and he put stones you know to to sleep to rest his head and he started to see angels ascending and descending he actually had picked one of the stones that he had used to establish the other altar and so because the altar was still active because the altar had obtained an open heaven angels started he said i saw like and he woke up and he said the lord is in this place and i did not even know it and he wrestled with god all night at that altar until the Lord said I want you to let me go and Jacob will not let you go unless you bless me and then the Lord asked Jacob what do you want and the Jacob said you need to bless me and then the Lord changed his name and then he called that place Peniel he called that place the place where I met God and he changed my name there are so many principles that we learn from that one of them is that an altar like I said is a place where you meet with the spirit realm but also an altar usually has a name the altar where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son at Mount Moriah that altar Abraham called it Jehovah Jireh the Lord himself will provide and so most of the names that we actually know as names of God were names of altars. Now every altar has a mandate. It has a reason for which it was set up. The one where Abraham was was set up for sacrifice and in return God gave. He did not only give life back to Isaac but gave Abraham a nation and nations. And therefore that, law, that altar was an altar for provision that altar was an altar for redemption and that was its mandate the altar which Jacob was at or Israel now in this case was an altar for the change of a name and the change of dispensation it was an altar for redemption it was an altar for help that was its mandate our father there's every place where they dug wells they actually dug an altar even that place where the Samaritan woman met Jesus where there was a well it was called Jacob's well because remember the Samaritan woman asked Jesus are you stronger are you bigger than our forefather the one who actually built this well or dug this well that altar was an altar of renewal and that is why that Samaritan woman was renewed from on the inside out when she met Jesus at that altar. And therefore, I want all of us to understand that it is simply a place or and a time for us to meet with God. You're not going to win battles because you have an altar. But yes, you are going to meet God. And yes, there is going to be acceleration in your life. But it, I'm not saying that live your life as you want, be as sinful as you want, and then have a sanitizer called an altar. That is not true. It's, going, it's not going to help you. Now, when you're establishing an altar, what are some of the things that you need to do? Number one, because an altar is a structure now let me tell you as an engineer an altar is a structure and therefore it has a foundation then it has the substructure okay the sub sorry the substructure the foundation then it has the superstructure that is the walls and everything and then it has sort of like a roof like it has to be completed so an altar is like a structure now when we are building structures we put them on foundations now when you put it on a faulty foundation it is going to crash it is going to fall that is why I've told you that you cannot leave 
sin and then say so long as I have an altar. That is what the Gentiles do. That is why that, that's what the non-believer does. That's what the person who doesn't know God does. They can live in whichever the way they want and then over the weekend they can go and visit Jaja and they can go to the altar, nurse Amir and you know they can do whatever they want to do and then they can come back. In our kingdom, you cannot do things like that. An altar must be established on the right foundation. And there is no foundation than the Lord Jesus Christ. But hey, Jesus is not just going to lie down and lay his life down and you establish on him full of sin. So the very first thing that we do when we are establishing altars is to bring repentance. Now repentance, there are three things that I want to say about repentance. Number one. When you are bringing repentance, it needs to be heartfelt. And I usually tell people that every time you are coming to God in prayer, it is good for you to prepare. Prepare. If you are coming in repentance, don't just enter the room and just start to say, I repent of this, I repent of that. Sometimes because you didn't prepare, you will forget certain things. I like to first reflect and say, I last prayed at 2 a.m. Between 2 a.m. and 1 p.m. when I'm going to pray, what are some of the things that have been happening? I shouted at my son for no good reason. I shouted at that boda boda man. I engaged in some form of gossip with my husband. I lied when I told the other shopkeeper that I would be back when I was not planning to come back. It's usually a very good practice to write down your things or to think about them. But also it is a good thing to be like David who told God, he said, search my heart and see if there is anything strange within me. Reveal it to me. Actually, the message Bible says, investigate my heart. Carry out an investigation and then reveal to me and then lead me in the way everlasting. So it is a very good thing for you to just first stop. I usually like to tell the spirit of the living God, search me, search me. I'm about to establish an altar, but search me. Search me concerning the sins of today and search me concerning the sins of yesterday. Search me concerning things I have been doing that I've been thinking are right. Search me. And so I usually tell people that don't start to do an altar just today, right now, immediately after this teaching. I usually tell people that Take a bit of time and take a bit of season and let the spirit of the Lord search your heart. And as he keeps searching your heart, you write these things down and then you start to bring repentance. Now, the second thing I want to tell you is repentance can be in two ways. There is personal repentance. That's the things you've done yourself. And then there is identification repentance. That is things that maybe you, you, that you've engaged in as a community or things that a community that you're part of engaged in. Like my forefathers, you know, in my village, there was a time when there were shrines, when babies would be born, you had to take them to that little house. They would cut us, you know, to put apparently medicine to, to protect us. But you see, that is wrong because the Lord is my protector. The Lord is my help. The Lord is my shed at my right hand. So when we were engaging in those things, we were actually telling God that you were unable to protect me. And then in the naming ceremonies, the things that happen, and then in the burial ceremonies, the things that happen that you got engaged in, you were probably a child, but you were a part of a community. Because for me personally, I remember when I was a little child, they would tell you that you are going to clean your grandfather, the, that the person is dead, but as, as, as children, you're going to clean to wash the dead body. The dead body comes from the hospital when it is already cleaned up. Why do we have to clean it up again? But then they have brought a ritual, they have certain banana stems, they have broken them down in a certain way, and you know we do them one out of fear. And yet God has said, I've not given you a spirit of fear. So if you have picked up a spirit God has not given you, you have sinned. Because they would say things like, if you do not do that, the dead person will come back to you in your dreams. That is a spirit of fear. And we participated either knowingly or unknowingly, but that is what they call identification repentance. And that is why I'm telling you that take your time. Maybe you need to start to chronologically think about things from that time you were born. What are some of the things that were happening to you? Because we got involved in things like that. We got involved in things like, um, Last funeral rites, uh, apparently you are chasing the spirit of death and if you do not get engaged in it, death will come back to your house. But what does God say? 
Our life is in the Lord's hands. He is the one who protects us. He's the one who watches over us. You know, there is something strange that happens, especially in weddings and introductions and then burial ceremonies and when we give birth. I will teach you about gates at one point. And those three gates are very, very critical in us, especially for us Africans. When we get children, we engage in a lot of rituals when we are getting married the things that happened i hear if you do not bring engage in kasuzekatia something will happen to your marriage but then that same person after doing the things in the dark by the one we do them in the dark eh? in the dark at 6 a.m 5 a.m after doing those things in the dark then you appear in your white robe before the lord to also get a blessing and then when you finish that you go to the party and then you start to drink yourself silly you see those things but then you want the blessing of God upon your marriage. And then when I say establish an altar, a marital altar, you will forget all that stuff because that stuff is the foundation. You're going to forget your foundations and you are going to go and you say, oh, and I established this altar upon the tenets and the foundations of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not your peer. Jesus is not your baby brother. He is not going to come. He's not going to allow those things. I usually tell people that one of the reasons I actually think that my marriage has been good and i credit my father i miss my father and i love my father for that it is strange and none of you can believe it but when i was getting married they did not do any ritual nothing me unisa dubango i left my father's house at 9 a.m and it is a friend that picked me they did not do anything like Asuze Katia. Actually, my dad at that point, he was born again, but he was not yet very rooted. But he used to ask me, he used to say, Eunice, just show it to me. In the Bible, we will do it. If it is not there, we will not do it. And if it is there and I don't understand it, we are not going to do it. So for me, Eunice, nothing like Asuze Katia. I hear sit on the laps of your singer. I hear over do what? The things they do in the introduction room. Over eat, eat, pee, uh, what are they called? The coffee beans, what? Nothing. When the people reached our home, you know we sanitize things as born again. Eh? I hear we are going to give a drink to the elders of the clan, or the gods. So the other people pour mwenge, they pour wine, they pour spirits. For you, you do the same ritual, but you pour the fanta. You see, the activity is the thing. It is not in what you poured. Whether you poured water or you poured tonto, you fed quote unquote the gods of the clans. And that is why you need to keep your eyes open because some of you, I came to Kampala, I am in London, they do all these stupid rituals and you don't know. I have a friend who lost her husband and they told her the coffin must be on their bed, on their mattress. And then I hear you have to first put on his shoes before we make him put them on. And then you, we must tie you with his shirt. But God is saying that I am the husband to the widow. And God on the other side is saying that I will take care of you. That I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then the same guy is saying that the shirt will uphold you. I hope you're getting me. So there is heartfelt repentance. And heartfelt repentance is going to come when you plan your repentance. And by the way, let me tell you, I have gone through seasons of repentance over certain things which took me almost three months because I want to totally clean up. And sometimes when I'm about to finish, the spirit of the Lord reveals another whole set and I'm like, God, when is this season going to end? You see, as a prayer leader, one of the things that amuses me is in church, the time for repentance is usually the shortest and it is the quietest. When you tell people, let's repent, Three minutes later, they are out. They don't have any words. And usually they are soft. But let's say, let's bind the devil. That roof will almost go off. You will actually have to clap your hands and tell them, shh. Because we deal with the devil more than we deal with our hearts. But I want to tell you that God looks at the heart. God will descend immediately when the heart is there. Now, the Bible tells us in Psalms 51 that a broken spirit and a contrite heart, he will not despise. The third thing I want to tell you about repentance is when you plan your repentance, both personal and identification repentance, which was number two. Number three, repent properly. Speak out these things. I usually tell people you didn't sin in tongues. So why are you repenting in tongues? When you were stealing, when they gave you that money at work to shop for the office and you banged in jaulo, you know, like you took some off. Eh? 
you did not do it in tongues. You did it in your vernacular. You did it in understanding. So come to God with your heart. By the way, with prayer, better to pray with heart than to pray with the mind. So come to God and say, Father, I am sorry that when they told me to go and clean up that dead body and told me to repeat the following words, I used this mouth. I was a child, but your word says in Psalms 8 that from the lips of children, you have ordained praise to silence the foe and avenger. So even if I was a child, my lips were ordained for praise. Lord, I ask you to forgive me. Now, Lord, I am also angry that my grandfather made me do those things. But Lord, I bring repentance that I am angry with him. Lord, I ask you to forgive me because you have told me to love my neighbors as I love myself. You bring repentance audibly. You speak what you feel. You speak what you know it feels, God feels. You can even tell him, and Lord, when I participated in these marital rituals, when I said that I have to do chogero for my children because chogero gives them favor, the Bible says that favor doesn't come from the east or from the west. So if Chogero is in the east, it doesn't come from there. If Chogero is in the west, it doesn't come from there. But it comes from God. You have to come and say, Lord, when I did it, I did it in stupidity and not understanding. I did it in fear. I did it because I didn't want my mother-in-law to get angry with me. But the Bible says that the fear of man ensnares. And Lord, I am sorry that I finished to do it. Then I also went to church. And I pretended to be dedicating my child. Father, forgive me. Because in doing this, I made my child's foundation shaky. I am probably responsible for some of the things that are happening to my children. Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I hope you understand. So you need to bring repentance. If you are establishing now, also finally, you bring repentance also based on the type of altar that you want to establish. If the altar is a marriage altar, then you have to bring repentance concerning the things that you have been doing in that marriage. Maybe you had premarital sex. Maybe you aborted several times. You've shed innocent blood. Even if you ended up marrying that same man, you did what is wrong in the sight of God. So you can't establish a marriage altar there. Maybe you were unequally yoked with an unbeliever. You real God saved in God, you know it. That God condones this, but your fear that, ah, I am aging. Then your reasoning, your manly reasoning. Ah, you know, born again men and ask us, oh, they are not romantic. God is able to create for you what you want. God did not refuse. You were impatient or you did not seek him and you decided. Now in this marriage, you want to do a marriage altar as a sanitizer. It won't happen like that. So you bring your marital sin before God and you say, Father, we engaged in sex outside wedlock, yet we made it look like we were holy. We came to your altar and we lied to the world. Father, have mercy on us. I have been watching pornography on the side, yet you have told me what my eyes should do. You have even told me that some things should not even be talked about, but me, I'm doing them. I do this and I say the other. I don't take care of my spouse. I have abused my spouse. I, you know, a marriage altar is going to work under the tenets of marriage according to the Bible. So if you form a marriage altar, but you have to keep your own man aside, your things, we will teach on this channel about unity in marriage with man. That marriage altar cannot sanitize the marriage. By the way, the thing about altars is so important and it is such a thick thing that sometimes rather not to establish the altar. Because you see, the altar can retaliate itself. You know, like the altar can work against you instead. So if it is for your children, you bring repentance on behalf of your children, you'll be like Job. Job used to say, ah, Lord, he would sacrifice every time the children would finish a part. He would come to God and he would say, maybe they sinned. You understand? So, deep, if it is a workplace altar, because there are many, you can establish as many altars as you want. You can establish an altar for your work. I have altars. I have an altar for Uni's kitchen. Okay? So, it is a workplace altar. 
and I continually bring repentance on that altar on behalf of the team. But when I was establishing that altar, I did identification repentance on behalf of the team because me, I'm in a righteous marriage. I'm in a marriage according to the word of God. But there are people who are coming to this altar and they are cohabiting. They have said all sorts of things to sanitize it, but that is what it is. So I have to bring repentance on behalf of this. I'm dwelling a lot on the thing of repentance because it is the foundation. The foundation has to be strong. So you can have an altar for the workplace. You can have an altar for your break every, any existing covenant. Why? Because most altars have covenants. Usually we covenant to Tomukago. We make certain agreements with the deity. I have an altar. I had an, there was an altar that was in my father's lineage that almost destroyed me. And one of its covenants, so its understandings was that in the whole family, the agreement they had when they were establishing the altar was that in the whole family, no one should ever go beyond a certain level in school. So everybody, whenever they would reach a certain level, actually no girl in the family. So every time a girl reached that level, they either got pregnant or they died. One of those two things happened. But it is an agreement. It was a, an existing covenant. So if you're establishing an altar for your children, then you come in the name of Jesus and you break any existing covenant using the covenant of the blood of Jesus. So this is what you say, because many of you are going to say, write down for me what I can say. You say in the name. Now, sometimes you know the covenants and that's why it's good for you to first research. Okay. Don't just always uh, be comfortable praying things blindly. So now, like for me, in the example I've given you, I, I came and I said, in the name of Jesus. Remember, now I've finished to repent. So because I've finished to repent, I'm now on a clean slate as far as me and Jesus is concerned. So then I came and I said, and in the name of Jesus, every covenant that exists concerning my education, for example, the covenant that says X, Y, Z, using the blood of the eternal covenant, I destroy that covenant. Now, some of you are going to say, what if I don't know the covenants? The Holy Spirit is a teacher. The Holy Spirit is an enabler. The Holy Spirit can teach you all things. There is what they say, dreams and visions. That's why I said, take some time before you establish an order and say, Spirit of the living God, lead me to any information that is useful for me in this particular thing. I know people who suddenly... God sends someone in there. Maybe they just have this sudden conversation with an uncle. And then the uncle just seamlessly starts telling them things. But I know a, a prayer mentor, God himself made her to dream. God is not going to work the same way. Okay. For me, I had different relatives tell me. Okay. But I know people, they dreamt. Then I know people. Suddenly, a mother-in-law visited. And then as they were conversing, the mother-in-law started to say things. All I want you to do is to pray for a sense of alertness and tell God, when this information begins to come to me, Father, give me a sense of alertness. So when your mother-in-law starts to speak, you become alert, you're not down. Then you are alert enough to ask the right questions. Because sometimes the information comes to you, but like I've told you an example of, how uh, for me, when I was born, I was born premature. I had a great grandmother called Eunice who had said she, she doesn't want to die unless she held me. Okay. She, it, and I think in her mind, it was an innocent thing. Okay. And so when I was born, she said, oh, I want to hold her. So they took me to her. And when she held me, she gave me her name Eunice. And then she said she made certain covenants to the effect that everything as was in her life would be in my life. And that's how I got you know, strange illnesses and things like that. Now, for me, one day, I got very, very sick and I went home. And then my, my father said, he said, ah, Eunice Vanang, she just reminds me of my grandmother, Eunike, all the time, she's sickly. So I was alert then I said, hey, what was with Eunike? Then my dad told me the story. So what you need to do is to pray, God, by the Spirit, reveal to me. God, by, diff, by visions and dreams, reveal to me. God, bring me divine helpers to speak to me. But also sometimes if you're in good working terms, and that's why unity and good working terms is important, okay? If 
you are in good working terms with people, ask them. Because you can actually ask your auntie. You can actually make a visit. Don't just fall in it. You know, pray about it and visit and then ask. And then say, auntie, strange things have been happening to me. Do you know anything? So you break every existing covenant and any satanic foundation. You don't have to make a long prayer. Shake, break. The blood of Jesus is enough. Mention the issue and say, by the blood of the eternal covenant, I break this existing foundation and covenant. Now, when you are done, because you repented, you broke the covenants, the next best thing to do is to establish godly covenants. Now, that is where many of us probably make it wrong, uh, get it wrong. So, establishing godly covenants, a covenant is an agreement that you have between, usually it is a higher power and a lesser power, because so that the lesser power gets a bit of help from the higher power. Now, for us, we are nothing without the Lord. So we covenant with the Lord so that we start to depend on his strength to be able to manage. So if, for example, it's an altar for your children, you now enter a covenant with God concerning your children. Let me give you an example of a covenant that happened between a parent and a child. Um, one of the covenants that happened between a parent and a child was the, 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 the covenant in Joshua, where Joshua said, as for me, and my house, we will serve the Lord. He was covenanting his house to serve the Lord. He was connecting his house to the service of God. And as we serve God, the many things happen to us. David covenanted his eyes to the Lord. He said, I covenant my eyes. They will not even look at a girl or a woman lustfully. He covenanted the eyes. I know a woman of God who covenanted her children's privates to the Lord. And she spoke and she said, they will never sleep with any man or woman who is not their spouse until I release them at the altar of God. But don't make certain covenants like that so seriously. Because I know most of us, eh, we are not led of God. We just copy paste cut your kawuli. Even me, let me do. You see this woman, she put many other things around that covenant to make sure that it works. Never covenant thoughtlessly. That is why me, I sense that the better covenants, the easier covenants are the ones that are in the word. That is why now some of this life, the prayer life and these things of altar life are, is going to be hard for you if you don't know the Bible. If you don't read the word of God. Because you can just get covenants out of the word of God. Because now someone is about to send me a message. Uh -huh. Now me doctor. I've been, now my children are uh -huh. give me examples of covenants. I can't. They are yours. They are not mine. Like I cannot give you covenants for your marriage. I don't know your marriage. I can't give you the ones for your workplace. I don't know your workplace. I don't know what your mandate is. I don't know what God has called you to do. You must know this word of God. The incorruptible word of God by yourself. That's why when people tell you they read 10 chapters a day and you you on Netflix 10 hours a day but then you think that you're going to get what they get or you're always going to go to them to help you you are at a loss you are in trouble you are in problems and that's why they manipulate you that's why people say I, me I'll just pray for you just keep bringing the money this side and you know me those of you who know me know me I'm not like that I don't want to carry burdens of people when they also have a bag to carry their burdens so Establish godly covenants. Look in the word of God. God has established covenants. You know one of the covenants God made with man was that one of Noah. When they came out of the ark. He made a covenant. He said I will never destroy man. And I have even put a sign. So you can say Lord. I covenant my children to your service. Because the Bible says. That my children. You know. That they are like. They are like. Um. They are like tender shoots around my table. They are like arrows in my youth. Lord, I covenant my children to being shot into the house of the Lord as arrows in my youth. So establish godly covenants. Then the next thing is now connect that altar to other existing godly altars that have the same mandate. And it is simple. Just say, and I connect this altar to other existing godly altars that have the same mandate as this altar. Sometimes you say within a 10, a 10 kilometer radius, 20 kilometer radius, whatever. And if you know some of the altars, mention them. Like for me, if I'm near Watoto Church, which is my church, 
I, I, I can connect my altar to the altar at Watoto Church near me. Why do we connect altars to altars? Because altars work in a network. A stronger altar gives strength to a weaker altar. A weaker altar can uphold the stronger older, altar at some point when the stronger altar is, 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 is in trouble. But most importantly, don't just connect it to the existing altars here on earth. Connect that altar to the Lamb's altar. Okay, according to Revelations, there is a, an altar that is spoken about in Revelations chapter 8, verse 3 to 4, where the 24 elders are. Actually, the Bible says that at that altar, the prayers of the saints rise up like incense. So connect that altar. Now, the reason why we connect to that, the reason why we connect to the, these altars around us is to connect the network. But the reason why we connect to the altar above is so that we have an open heaven over our altar. Now, when you are done, you appropriate the blood of Jesus. To appropriate the blood of Jesus is to give the blood of Jesus mandate over the altar. That is what it means. So you now say, I appropriate the blood of Jesus. That the blood of the eternal covenant is the sprinkled blood over this altar. It is the blood that is allowed to speak over this altar. Because the Bible tells us in Colossians, in, in Hebrew, sorry, that that blood is the one that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So to appropriate this is to give that blood of Jesus permission to work. So just say, I appropriate the blood of Jesus over my altar. Then you ask the Holy Spirit to be a supervising spirit at that altar. Because every kingdom has those that it sends to work in the environment. In the satanic kingdom, there are demons. In the kingdom of God, it is the Holy Spirit and the angelic. Because the Bible tells us that angels are sent to help those who inherit salvation. So you call forth the angels of God and you say, May the, I call forth the angels of God to be the monitoring spirits at this altar. To ascend and descend every time there is need at this altar. And then you tell the Holy Spirit, say, and Holy Spirit, be the supervising spirit at this altar. There is no other spirit that is allowed to supervise at this altar. But remember, if you did not do absolute repentance, other spirits have uh, a bit of leeway at that altar. Now, when you are done, you offer thanksgiving to the Lord and you start sacrificing at the altar. Sacrifice can be in form of praise. Sacrifice can be in form of worship. Sacrifice can be in form of fasting. We don't only fast because there is a problem. Sometimes our fast is a sacrifice unto the Lord. You can wake up and you can say, on Monday, I am going to sacrifice. I'm going to bring a sacrifice of fasting. I'm going to do a whole teaching on fasting. So you start to sacrifice. You read the word of God. You do praise and worship at the altar. You can even bring an offering at your altar. Now, the question is, then Dr. Iris, where do I take the offering? You have a home church. You can go to church on Sunday now and present the offering before God and say, this is my offering from my altar called whichever name you have called it. Now, you give the altar name. What, how, how do you name? Because you are going to say, so how do I get the name of the altar? And that is why you need to learn to walk by the Spirit. Because in most cases, the Spirit of the Lord can also give the name on the, on the inside of you. But in most cases, I name my altars based on the mandate I want the altar to to hold if it if i want restoration in my family i can call it the altar of restoration if i want a uh, fruitfulness you know like i've told you in my kitchen i can call it the altar of fruitfulness doesn't have to be a hugely spiritual name i know people who have very many interesting beautiful names for their altars it can be as simply as the you can still call your altar jehovah jireh if you do not know how to name it or you do not have any other name, if it is an altar for provision, but give your altar a name and then speak out. And now these things, now you start to write down because we need to learn to keep records. Now, as believers, I know many of us don't keep records, but usually when I establish an altar, I keep records. What do I do? I open a page either in my journal or on my computer where I keep my documents or on my phone or, you know, all my Google Docs, I open a folder. Then I open a document, a word document. It doesn't have to be so spiritual. And then you say name of altar. Then you put the name you called the altar. Date when it, has, it was established. Then you put the date when you finished the work, not the date when you started repentance. Then you say the overall mandate of the altar. 
then you say this altar is mandated for fruitfulness in the Adubango family. Then you say supervising spirit at the altar. The Holy Spirit is the supervising spirit at this altar. Then you say time and place where this altar meets. Okay, so you can say this altar will meet at this altar will meet every Monday in my room with my husband or we will meet every Tuesday in my son's room with my son or I will meet every Thursday alone in my son's room. The thing is you are just putting a blueprint in the spiritual realm so that it is known that this altar exists and these are its characteristics. Now, some people are going to say, what if I'm alone? It's okay. You are meeting with God, so you're not alone. Some people are going to say, what if the people who are, I'm supposed to, uh, who, who, um, who this altar is mandated to help can't meet, you will meet with God. What if one of us in the US and one of us is in Uganda? That's why I told you that they are all, the, right now the internet is a place. Huh? That is the reason why people are even buying land in that space okay the metaverse like those things happen so you can say this altar will be monday at 10 a.m the 10 a.m is quote unquote a place but sometimes you want it in a particular place in your house that is also fine okay i don't meet with my sisters in a particular location but we have a time and a day when we meet it is very good for you to maintain that time and that day why because god begins to expect you on the time you have said it is just being you know being able to set spiritual appointments and keeping them but if you say we'll meet on monday at 10 a.m and for some reason you meet at 2 a.m god will still meet with you but then you do not want to have those unawares things in the realm of the spirit so that's why you say you know now don't be unserious to say doctor what if me i'm so sure my timetable here it does not allow me me what if i just say i'll be meeting on monday any time so you if god also says i shall be coming to see you any time i feel like would you like that some things are just done so that the lord expects you and so that you can push away anything and do as much as possible to come. Some people say, which is the best time? There is no best time. God created all time. Yes, I know the teachings of gates. I know midnight. I know 2, 3 a.m. Don't be legalistic about it. I know those things. And I know those gates. But when unto you it turns idolatrous. That's why you have prayed for a long time and nothing has happened. Because of idolatry. So I have times when I pray at 3 a.m. I don't pray at 3 a.m. Because God answers prayers only at 3 a.m. That is not true. But yes, it is a gate. So don't say which is the best time. The best time is when you know that you know that you know. That you're going to keep that appointment with God. And when you tell God to expect you. You are going to be there. So then you say. What are the other altars that are being connected to? Then you say the Lamb's altar in glory, according to Revelations. This, by the way, it's always good in brackets to put scriptures hmm, over each of those things that you are saying, and don't always ask doctor like which scripture. Learn to search the scriptures. Be like the Bereans. Learn to Google. Learn to say scriptures talking about altars. Abraham establishing altars. Altars that Jacob established. Altars in the Old Testament, learn a believer who has to be spoon fed. That's why you're manipulated all the time. You have a phone in your hands, you can search these things. Now, when you are done, then you put together the things that are key, the key mandates. There is the overall mandate, fruitfulness. And then what are the key? Okay? And then you can say, number one, that the work of our hands will be blessed according to this scripture number two because remember this is altar of fruitfulness that everything that will be blessed with lands and whatever whatever you can put whatever you want to put always don't go to god as if you have a shopping list so that the mandate has 20 points those are things i taught in travels of a mother don't come to god as if you'll never come back again usually i tell people let the altar have probably just about four mandates you know four five and write them down and put the scriptures now briefly quickly before I close this. Now, at every altar must have a sitting priest. That's why where there is Jaja Mwanga, there is a, 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 a deity. 
there is a, a person who, in whom Jaja Mwanga comes down. Now you, who is going to run that altar? You are the sitting priest at that altar. I am the sitting priest at the Eunice Kitchen altar. My husband and I are the sitting priests at our marriage altar. Okay? So the altar has a priest. But the priest must be understanding the God of that altar. So if you establish an altar like I have altars in Eunice Kitchen, people who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior are the ones who can serve at that altar. Everyone else can come when we are going to pray. I don't chase them. But they don't understand what we are doing as far as I'm concerned. Whether they go to church, whether they were baptized, whether what, as far as I'm concerned. At that point we are speaking a spiritual language and you are not a spiritual person so you cannot understand it. So at your altar, being nice goes as far as allowing everyone in the family, if it is a family altar together with you. But you don't tell them, now you pray for us. They are praying to who and under what power. They don't understand who they are dealing with. But you can come together. We can praise the Lord. We can do these things. But let those who have connected with Jesus and Lord, Lord and Savior. Because it is like getting a witch doctor and bringing them in church and telling them to preach the sermon for that day. Just think about it. Would that... Uh, it makes sense because you're trying to be nice mnange come as you are so you tell the judge mwango whatever to come and preach the sermon for that day because you're being nice now when you're servicing the altar first of all don't have an altar that is silent where you never meet when the sons of god were asleep the enemy sowed tears among the wheat so that altar which you established, but you would never pray there, you never keep the time, you never do any kind of offering there, it is going to reach a point and the enemy will sow, will sow tears in the wheat. So one of the ways for you to make sure that the altar is, the fire is burning, make sure prayer happens at that altar at the time you said it would, make sure there is sacrifice, make sure there is thanksgiving, make sure that the blood of the eternal covenant is appropriated at that altar, and make sure that you meet as often as possible at that altar. And make sure that the sitting priest at that altar is consistently living under the tenets of the word of God. Just send me any questions on altars. You can send them to my email that is going to run on the screen. I am going to continue addressing these things. I know some of them are tough. Like some are saying, isn't that discrimination? Munange God, interestingly, God is not a Democrat. God is not democratic. Like we are not going to have a voting session in heaven to see if Bambi people who didn't confess Jesus and Lord and Savior, but they were nice, they gave to the poor, if they should come in or not. Unfortunately, that's just how my father is. He's not a democrat. His word is final. And so when I tell you these things, because I know that is, that is just the way they are. I hope this has helped to answer so many questions about altars. And I hope now you're going to establish your altar. And I hope now you are going to start to give God the glory and to come to the Lord daily at your altar. Until next time, Eunice Adubango in my space. God bless you.